you're up on a mountain You've got peace of mind Like you've never known But then things change And you're down in a valley Don't lose faith you're never alone for the god on the mountain he's your god in the valley if things go wrong he'll make them right and the god of the good time he's still god in the bad time the day is still God in the night. Talk of faith when you're up on a mountain. Oh, but talk comes easy when life's at its best. But it's down in the valley. Oh, with the trials and temptations that's when faith is really put to the test for the god on the mountain he's still god in the valley things go wrong he'll make them and the God of the good time, He's the God in the bad time. God of the day is still God in the night. God of the day is still God in the night. He's, he's our, adver our adversary. And one thing about the devil, he's not afraid of us. He's not afraid of us. I know Pastor and Miss Susan is a man and a woman of God. But the devil ain't afraid of them. All of you are men and women of God. But the devil is not afraid of you. He's not afraid of anybody in this building. But he's afraid of what comes out of your mouth. He's afraid of in the name of Jesus. He's afraid of by the blood of Jesus. Anything that has to do with Jesus, the devil is afraid. The Bible says just the mention of the name of Jesus and demons shudder. They don't have to see him. He don't even have to be in the area. But just the mention of his name, they shudder. You see, the devil wants us to worry, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Don't worry. Be concerned, but don't worry. And I'm going to start off by going back to, uh, well, first of all, let me say, uh, as Michelle was saying, God don't want us to worry. He wants us to cast all our cares upon him. Okay? So, 
To me, that's a command. He didn't say, Willie, will you please cast all your cares upon me? No. He said, cast all your cares upon me. So if I don't cast all my cares upon the Lord and try to take care of it myself, guess what? I'm being disobedient. I'm being disobedient. So we need to cast all our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. Now I'm going to go back to a day in uh, 2001. That's when we had the uh, terrorist attack on this country. And uh, that's a day that I know I'll never forget. And many of you won't forget it either. But terrorism has become a great concern of this government and governments all over the world. And a lot of people are still worried. They're worried about, well, what if it happens again? What if they do that to us again and, and, and uh, it's more casualties? But I stopped by here to tell you this morning, don't worry about it. Be concerned, but don't worry about it because God is in control. He's in control. Terrorists are not in control. God is in control. And if we look at the things that are going on in the Middle East right now, that's enough to worry anybody to death. But that lets us know one thing. The coming of the Lord is at hand because that's God's time clock. Yeah. The Middle East. Yeah. Israel. Yeah. But don't worry about it. Be concerned, but don't worry about it. So with that said, how do we as Christians respond in these evil days? First of all, we got to understand that the Lord is giving us a warning of his second coming. And as that time approaches, these are the things that we're going to see in the world. Everything that you see is in this book. We know what the outcome is going to be. Why are we worried? Be concerned, but don't be worried about it. God got this. So, knowing this truth, why should we really be worried about what's going on in the world? We should be concerned, but not worried. We got Christian folks today worried about this economy. They worried about the, the stock market, the ones that have money there. They worried about if they're going to have enough or not. And on and on and on and on. But we have to stop and think. All this worrying ain't going to change nothing. It ain't going to change nothing. We need to stop worrying about it and stop praying about it. Prayer changes things, not worry. Instead, we need to put our trust in God. Because everything belongs to God anyway. That stock market, the, uh, the uh, money you got in the bank, the bank, all that belongs to the Lord. You're just a steward of it. Don't worry about it. You ain't going to take it with you. You're going to die here and the very person that you dislike is going to enjoy whatever you left. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. You know, I got a lot of family members that uh, are not saved. I discussed this with the pastor. I'm not worried about it. I'm concerned, but I'm not worried. I've told them what they need to do to get the Lord in their life. That ball is in their court. Jesus told his disciples to go out and spread the gospel. Go from town to town, city to city. 
But if they don't want to hear what you got to say, kick the dust off your feet and go on to the next one. So that's what I try to do. I don't try to beat people over the head. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm talking to people about God, and you are too. But see, and I hope this don't sound selfish, but these people have the same opportunity that you and I got. They could either serve the Lord or not serve the Lord. We got the same choice. We got the same opportunity. God is no respect to a person. But they're just making the wrong choices. But we still stand in the gap. We can't save them. We can't save nobody. We can't, if we're going to save somebody, we save ourselves. We can't save anybody. It's God. The Bible says it's God that draws men nigh to him. Not men that draw men to God. We don't draw men to God. We allow God to work through us. But God draws them to him. Not us. So, what should we do? As Christian folks, we should start worrying and we should start humbling ourselves. We should start humbling ourselves. Put up uh, Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, 14, please. If, could you put that up in the uh, King James, please? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, God was speaking to the Israelites when he said that, but that applies to us too. It applies to us too. There are people in our society today that really don't want to hear there's something wrong with them. Once upon a time, we were those same people. Once upon a time. Right now, in this country and other countries, homosexuality, it's okay. It's okay. Abortion. It's okay. It's okay. Children being born out of wedlock and premarital sex. It's okay. Some people think just because that we stand and say, God bless America, we're supposed to be blessed just because we're so nice. It don't work like that. It don't work that way. But God has already said to us, humble yourself. Humble yourself. So with that said, should we be worried about the things that I just spoke about? No. We should be concerned about it, though. We should pray about it, but not be concerned. I mean, not be worried. Put up 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to start with verse 1 through 4. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Next verse. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, next verse, without natural affection, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now, aren't these the kind of things that we are seeing in the world today? We're seeing all that right before our eyes today. And there should be no doubt 
in our minds what hour we're living in. No doubt. And that hour we're living in is the season for the return of Jesus Christ. That's the hour we're living in. We're living in that season where the return of Jesus Christ is this close. I knock at the door. And knowing this, I'm really not worried about a lot of the things that are going on in the world. I'm concerned, but I'm not worried. And just to be totally honest, there's a whole lot of things that I'm really not concerned about. A lot of foolishness. I ain't concerned about that. Now, when it comes to people's lives, that's totally different. Put up Genesis 6, 11 through 13, please. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, just reading those scriptures, don't you think that the Bible is kind of describing our day too? The day that we live in? The condition of violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition it is in today. The same condition. And there are so many people today that's advocating that the, the violence be removed and that the violence be restrained in our society. People are demanding that the governments do something about the wickedness that's going on in the earth. People believe that if the government would pass certain laws, all this violent behavior would be corrected. Wrong answer. People are looking to the government and not to God. We need to look to God. Government can't fix this. The government caused a lot of it. We need to look to God. Not just here in this country, but all over the world. It's got to be a corporate turning to God. Because the governments here and all over the world, they done did a lot of things, you know. They've done a lot of things, but there are not enough laws to cover every offense that happens in the world. There are not enough police manpower to police the systems. And there are not enough prisons to contain the wicked that's on this earth. But we can thank God for the police system that we have in place because the, it restrains the lawlessness that we have and it keeps them in check. However, corruption comes in and causes these governments to, to be corrupt and everybody suffers behind that. But, we got to look to God because that's man's idea to corrupt in the first place. We got to look to uh, a loving, kind God. We got to cast our cares upon him. And then everything would turn. God designed government. He designed government, but he designed government as an instrument to restrain all this stuff that's going on in the world. He didn't design the government to be like it is now. But when they become corrupt, everything changes. We don't want our government controlling everything. Rujo we Wilson don't said that the history of liberty is a history 
of limitations of governmental powers, not the increase of it. But if we paying attention, that's where we're headed. Where the government is taking over everything. That's where we're headed. Headed. And we know that all this violence is not going to be totally removed until the root is corrected. And everything that's going on today, it can't be dealt with by hiring more policemen uh, to monitor and arrest people and building bigger prisons and all that good stuff because our prisons are already filled to capacity. We got more people in prison than we got on the street, just about. There was a tree in the garden called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, right today, you got men and their programs that are pruning those branches of that tree right today while the root still remains intact. You got to remove the root to remove the cause. So what is the root of all this violence that we're witnessing? Rebellion against God. That's what it is. It's rebellion against God and the set laws that God have put in place. Bottom line, as long as that root is untouched, the tree is only going to grow more branches and bear more rotten fruit. And the only solution to the problem in this earth that everyone, not just Christian folk, but every human being on the face of this earth, repent and turn to God. That's the only solution that we have. We got to keep his laws and we got to keep his commandment and we got to allow Jesus to change the evil nature of men into the nature of him. But the only way we can do that is allow Jesus to come in our heart. But see, we can help in that process by preaching Jesus to those that are lost. We can help in that process. That's what we call a corporate turning to God. Everybody. Man can't do it. You got to have God to do it. Because we need God to step in and take over because if he don't, we're going to destroy the earth and, us and everybody in it. We're going to destroy each other. If we don't have God in our hearts, we're going to destroy each other. Because, you see, you got men running from one land to the next land, trying to make everything okay. They're trying to make everything right. They're holding a meeting over here in this country. They're holding a meeting over here in this country. Yeah, they got a plan. But it's the plan of man. It's the plan of man. And until they allow God Jesus Christ, to sit at that conference table, ain't going to be no peace. Ain't going to be no peace until they invite God to sit down at that conference table when they're having all these meetings in these different countries and here and there and going from, from place to place. It's going to take Jesus. See, we try to take God out of everything in our society today. We try to take God out of everything. We try to take God out of the schools. But trust me, somebody in that school is praying. We try to take God out of the government. Somebody in that government is praying. We try to take God out of the family. Somebody in that family is praying. That's why I'm here today. Somebody in my family was praying. Matter of fact, we can't take God out of nothing. 
We can try. We can't take God out of nothing. Why? Because he's God. He's everything. He's in everything. He's the creator. You can't remove the creator. You can remove yourself. But you can't take God out of nothing. You can try. He's the breath of life. So how are we going to take the creator out of anything? We can't do it. We need to stop it. But as Christians, we should pray for ourselves, and we should pray for the wicked also. We should pray that they would seek God with their hearts so they can be among those folks that are spared the destruction that's going to be coming up on this earth. Put up Matthew 24, 12 through 14. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So all that's going on in our world, God's still trying to get our attention. Oh, let me rephrase that. God ain't trying to do nothing. He has our attention. But a lot of us are not paying attention. A lot of times we say we are too busy with our own agendas that we don't hear the voice of God. But being the God that he is, he get our attention in any way he can. You see, God has a whole lot of methods to get somebody's attention. God, he can use creatures, he can use places, he can use things to get our attention. If he wants us to pay attention to him, he can use all those things to get our attention. He used the mule to talk to Baal. And, you know, Baum was a pagan prophet who practiced all kind of magical arts. And uh, he uh, led Israel into apocrisy. And uh, he was identified as a false prophet by Peter. But see, God knew that he was about to curse his people. So he used that mule to get his attention. God used the rooster to remind Peter that he lied and turned his back and denounced his own savior. And today, God will use ants to teach lazy people how to be smart and prepare for the future. Thank God, all right. The Bible prophesies about all these events that are going to take place in this world that we live in. And the explosion of violence worldwide is one of those events, the explosion of violence. I, as well as you, are beginning to see this process take place right now in this world. We're beginning to see this. Why? Because we are in the shadow of the millennial kingdom. It's coming, folks. Ain't no doubt. It's coming. The Bible speaks of a time of judgment that occurs during the tribulation period before the Lord's second coming. Put up Matthew 13, verses 38 through 43. The field is the world. That's us, the good seed of the truth. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Let me stop right there for a second. 
the terrors of the children of the wicked one. That's the devil. You know, I have to say this. I've said this before. We was having a Sunday school class, <laughs> and pastor said, once upon a time, the devil was your father. Boy, that went to my core. But he was telling the truth. Before I came on this side of the cross, the devil was my father over there on the other side of that cross. He was my father. He was all of our fathers. But now that we're on the other side of the cross, it's God the Father. Go to the next verse, please. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Next verse. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Iniquity. That means evil doing or infamy, depravity. When you use it as a noun, it means the lack of justice or righteousness, wickedness or injustice. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be a welling of na and gnashing of teeth. See, these are the angels of God that's going to remove these tares. Then shall the righteous shine forth, the son in the kingdom of their father, who had ears to hear, let him hear. So if you're listening to me, you got ears. Hear what I'm saying. No, hear what the Spirit is saying. I ain't saying it. The Spirit is saying it through me. Now, these tares, which are the wicked people in this parable, they're being bundled up for destruction. God's angels are bundling them up for destruction because of the evil that they did in the earth, the evil that they did in that body. And while God is separating his people from the world system so he might protect and reward them. Pastor was talking about that this morning. See, God's wrath is for the wicked. Right. Not for us. It's for the wicked. It was for us at once upon a time. But it's not for us anymore. His wrath is for the wicked. And God removes his people so they won't be under the wrath of God because the wrath of God is not promised to us. But it's promised. It's promised to the wicked. And God, back to, he's not a man that he should lie. He's telling the truth. This is going to happen. The wicked are going to be punished. Ain't you glad you're on this side of the cross? Yeah. And all this is uh, a form of judgment. It's a form of judgment. And most of the time when we hear that word judgment, 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 we usually think of judgment with uh, negative connotations. But judgment has a positive side. It has a positive side. Judgment in today's world right now, a lot of folks, I hear folks say, God is judging this nation. Well, I don't know, but in my heart, I believe it's a process of reaping what you sow. You know, so I think God is saving all his judgment until the time of judgment. Man's opponent wants to die, and then comes the judgment. You know, so I ain't going to go that far. So let's define that process of reaping and sowing. Put up Galatians 6, 7 through 9, please. Be not deceived. 
God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Next verse. But he that soweth to his flesh shall reap, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So what is God saying? God's telling us, don't you fool yourself. I would not be mocked. I would not be made a fool out of. It may take 20 days. It may take 20 years. But as long as you got breath in this body, you're going to reap what you sow. That's a law God put in there actually before the foundation of the world. You're going to reap what you sow. Ain't no doubt by mine. I know I reaped a whole lot of things I sowed 30 years later. And a lot of you have reaped what you sow. Some of us may be still reaping what we sow. The Bible tells us that there's no good thing in this flesh. So if there's no good thing in this flesh, why sow to the flesh? Why sow to it, to it if there ain't no good thing in it? Because if we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap death. But if we sow to the spirit, we're going to reap everlasting life. That's just like God saying, I put before you life and death. Choose life. See, God is a, is a God that he, he tells you what to do. We don't know what to do, but he tells us what to do, and he tells us what to do in this word. That's why we got to get in it. We got to learn the character of God. And the only way to learn the character of God is get into this word. Now, from these scriptures, we can see that negative side of judgment, which is evil that is sown that reaps destruction, while on the positive side, the good that is sown through Jesus is rewarded. Catch what I just said now. Through Jesus, not through yourself. Because if you try to do it through yourself, you're going back to the flesh again. In order to get the reward, you got to do it through Jesus. The Bible declares that the way into the kingdom of God is straight and narrow. And very few people find it. That tells me that everybody ain't going to be saved. Put up Luke 13, verse 24. And let us not no, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able to. So he's telling me to put forth every effort, Willie. Put forth every effort in Christ to enter at that straight and narrow gate. Don't be lackadaisical and... Uh, about entering at that gate. Remember now that the Holy Spirit is right there with us and he will help us if we strive. Like Pastor always tell us, we got our part and God got his part. So if we do our part, which we are, we on that narrow path. A lot of folks ain't going to find that narrow path because they're going to be disobedient they don't want to hear the word. They don't want to do good. A lot of people just got evil in them. I had a lot of evil in me at once upon a time. But thank God for this word. And thank God for Jesus Christ. Amen. Put up Luke, I mean Matthew 7, verse 14, please. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Few find it. 
You know, because this flesh, this flesh don't want to be restricted. This flesh don't want to be restricted. This flesh want to do everything its way. Not God's way, but its way. And because this flesh don't like a straight or restricted way, we see in, uh, destruction on a massive level at this very hour. All over the world. And it's not God initiating this destruction against mankind. No, it's not God. But it's the result of the evil fruit manifesting this destruction. Because God can't do evil. God's a good God. He's righteous. He's pure. Think about this. The negative judgments that are in this world that are manifesting in violence, like these terrorist acts, these wars, earthquakes, fires, hurricanes, and et cetera, et cetera, they are a direct result of broken spiritual laws. A direct result of broken spiritual law. So in the midst of all this crooked and this perverse generation, we as Christian folks, we should be lights for the lost. We should be lights for the lost and filled with the love of God. Since we are saved, we ought to look saved. We ought to talk like we're saved. People should see us coming down the street and say, there comes a child of God right there. That person saved. I love what Pastor says about Miss Susan when she's in Walmart or, or wherever, how she just glows and people see that. They don't even know her, but they see that. Yeah. I see it. You all see it. And most of all, we should be filled with the Spirit. Got to be filled with the Spirit. Because if we feel with the Spirit, then we can worship the Lord without reservations. We can worship the Lord no matter where we are. Cutting the grass, cleaning up the bathroom, it don't matter. Shopping, driving the car, we can worship the Lord if we feel with the Spirit. And if we feel with the Spirit, we won't leave church before the service is over. And I know this service is running a little long. <laughs> But if you feel filled with the Spirit, you hang in here. <laughs> and if we are spirit filled with the Spirit, we can walk like Daniel did when he was in the lines then and not be afraid. Because God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And if we are spirit to fit the Spirit, we can be just like Paul. We can preach. Our way into a Philippian jail and pray our way out. That's right. <laughs> if we feel with the Spirit. <laughs> now, as, as uh, my brother so eloquently on Wednesday night said, God promises us a place of peace and safety in the midst of all this violence that's going on around us. He pr my, pata, pata. So don't worry about what's going on in the world. Be concerned, yeah. Just like Noah and his family, they were kept saved from the flood waters in the ark. Yeah, and we are kept saved from the flood of the violence in our spiritual ark, which is Jesus. As long as we're in Jesus, we don't have to worry about nothing. Because the only safe place for believers or even non-believers depends on our surrender and obedience to the living God. Then and only then is there safety in the will of God. That's where we want to be, in the will, in the safety of the will of God. It don't matter, you know, what physical place you're living. Our safety is in him. 
Put up Psalms 91, verse 5 through 7. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. My goodness. Ain't that awesome? Now see, that's a promise of God. That's a promise of God. And we have to stand on that promise. Again, God is not a man that he should lie. See, a man going to lie. But God can't lie. He probably can, but he ain't. He's too pure to do that. So we have to stand on that promise. But still, we... As Christians, we've been victims of violence and suffering. And a lot of times, Christian folks will ask why. Even though God promises us safety, we'll ask why. A lot of folks do this because there are two things that they don't understand. They don't understand that there are basically two kinds of suffering. One the suffering for Christ. This suffering is the kind that we go through for the cause of Christ. And we are persecuted for being righteous. Example, like going that extra mile or turning the other cheek or going without pleasures for the gospel's sake. Or suffering because somebody has done us wrong. And the list goes on and on. But then there's suffering because of our sins. See, we got sins of commissions. And these are the deliberate or premeditated sins of rebelling against God's ways. We've been there. And then we have sins of omission. These are the sins like failure to pray. Failure to give, failure to obey, the failure to take time to learn God's ways by reading his word. God said what? He said, you draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. So we got to get in the word. We got to learn God's character by getting in his word and reading it and finding out about God. And we got to come to church. We have to be here. God commands us to be here. He don't ask us to be here. He tells us to be here. To fellowship with each other. So there's a whole lot of things that people miss out on. Even if I miss a Sunday, I know I done miss something good. It don't make no difference if Michelle's teaching or Charles or the pastor or whoever's up here. I done miss something good. So we need to be here because God commands us to be here. So if we ain't here, we guess what? We're being disobedient. Being disobedient. Put up James 4, 17, please. I'm getting close, y'all. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and do it in not, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. That's why a lot of folk are suffering, not because of they are so rebellious, but because they are ignorant of the words of God and his ways. Put up Hosea 4, 6, please. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Oh my thou goodness. Thou shalt be no thou sh priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. My, my, my. 
I know I don't want that. See, he's not talking about not the intellect of the world. Intellect of the world, that's good for some things. Not everything, but it's good. But see, he's talking about the knowledge of him. The knowledge of God. You can be the smartest individual on this planet. But if you don't have the knowledge of God, what good is it? It ain't no good. If you don't have the... They work hand in hand. God's knowledge is really the only knowledge anyway. Because the knowledge that we get from the world, might as well say God passed it on. The good stuff, all the good stuff comes from above. Everything good comes from above. Sometimes we suffer because we are lazy and complacent. We don't pray like we should. We don't read the Bible like we should. We don't witness for Christ. And we don't give our tithes and offering. Robbing God. Well, when we do these things, we build a relationship with Jesus and each other. And each other. So God's safety is, is uh, promised through our relationship with him and each other. And each other. Pastor always tells us, how can you love God whom you don't see and hate your brother who you see? We must totally commit to God's will. We must obey his word that's written down in this book. Most of all, we got to overcome self. We got to overcome sin. And we got to overcome Satan. And we can do all that with the help of God. But we got to rely on him. We can't do it in our own strength. Because if we try to do it in our own strength, trust me, we're going down the tubes. So to be an overcomer at this hour... And conquer the threat of violence against us, we must walk in faith and trust God's promises and safety and deliverance. We have to remember what Jesus said in Matthew. Put up Matthew 24, 6, please. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Wow. Right there, he's telling us not to worry. Be concerned, but don't worry about it. Go down to verse 13 and 14. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Bottom line, things in this world are going to happen. We can't stop it from happening. They're going to happen. But as a Christian, don't worry about it. Pray about it. That's about the only thing you can do anyway that's going to help. It's prayer. I guess Peter said it best when he said, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward for the day and speed its coming. Pastor says all the time, he read it. He read it. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm ready too. Yes. I'm ready. I'm sick of it. I'm ready. <laughs> 
For us, this means that we should live our lives in such a way that we reflect our understanding of what is going to happen. Because this life that we live is passing away very quickly. We're only a vapor. And our focus should be on heaven and the new earth to come. Our holy and godly lives should be a testimony to those people that don't know the Savior. We should be a testimony to those folks. They don't know God. A lot of them won't even say the name of God. But we should be a testimony to those folks. And we should be telling people about God. So that they can escape the fate that's going to await those folks that reject him. We got to tell people about the Lord. So in the meantime... We wait. We wait in eager anticipation for God's Son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Jesus. Who delivers us all from the wrath to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Father, in a world where the negative is dominant everywhere, we thank you for being the God of every blessing, the fountain of every joy, and the source of everything good. We know that it is in your heart, Father, to bless the lives of your children. And as your children, we declare your blessing upon our lives. Father, we thank you that your blessing has enriched our lives and leaves us without sorrow. Bring us the treasures of your grace, Father, and express all kinds of your favor. Thank you, Father, that you, your blessings are abound to us in Christ. They are ours freely because of the great price he paid. We thank you that because of him you have showered upon us every blessing that heaven could possibly give. And Father, it is our prayer that we don't worry about the things we see happening in this world. Be concerned but not worry. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray, our Lord, our Savior, our God. Amen.